Hi, everyone. Welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. Are you interested in joining the fight to protect all animals? Carrie and I are talking about how you can sign up to volunteer and make an impact. But first, Carrie, we got to talk about it. Uh, we, we have some exciting news. Hillary, our, our guest here, I want to let you know, too, we have broke the top 100 charts in society and culture for the podcast in Nepal. That is, is cool. very exciting. Very exciting. We have listeners yes. where we don't even expect right. to find them. I love it. <laughs> congratulations. Uh, congratulations. You know, I've spent, um, I've been lucky enough to go to Nepal a couple of times, um, including once at a conference and met so many animal advocates all over Nepal. I'm not at all surprised that we have listeners. Cool to be able to see Super them. cool. I'm glad you're not surprised because we were surprised. <laughs> <laughs> not at As all. usual, you know more than we do. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. No, it's su super exciting news. Um, thought we'd bring it up really quickly. But today we have a very topical subject, uh, the cover story of All Animals, which is the Humane Society of the United States member magazine. It's just hitting their mailboxes. It is on volunteering. And so the highlighted expert in that article just happens to be our guest today that you just heard uh, a little bit ago. So Hillary Hager is the Senior Director of Outreach and Engagement at the Humane Society of the United States. So we're so glad that you are able to sit down and chat with us. Thanks for having us. I am an avid listener of this and many podcasts, so it's like a dream come true for a Monday uh, to be able to be here with you all. I look forward to the conversation. Yeah. When you say having us, Hillary, is that like the royal us because that's how important you are? Or because you really like us. <laughs> us and my team. Uh -huh. talking about volunteer she, engagement. This is the best part. She, she caught that really well. That was a, that was a perfect response. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, Hillary, so the title in All Animals is Do Good, Feel Good. So in your experience, what effect does volunteering have on someone? And, and am I really going to feel good by doing good? Uh, well, I think, you know, everybody's different, of course. But I think, you know, there is something about being of service that really, um, uh, you know, gives us a good bump of good energy and good feelings and probably all the good hormones. And Endorphins, happy, right? oxytocin, all, hormones. Yeah, all that stuff. All it, probably. Um, and, you know, and I, I do, I, you know, I've heard recently... Um, you know, I'm not a doctor. I uh, have a master's degree, but I'm not you, a doctor. You play so one on TV. <laughs> yeah, I don't even do that very well either. Um, but, I, but I do, you know, when times are hard and it feels when, you know, a lot of people are having a hard time, especially in the last year with the pandemic. And, you know, it's just been really difficult for a lot of people. And it's hard sometimes to know how to help yourself. Um, but a lot of the recommendations I've been seeing have been focused around, you know, sometimes when you don't know how to help yourself, the best thing you can do is try to help others um, because it can help you gain a little bit of perspective and help you to really, um, you know, just to focus sort of externally a little bit, um, which I think is always great. But, you know, there are so many different ways to, to plug in and so many different things to do. Like, I think that you know, there's sometimes people want to, they have a set of skills that they want to apply in a particular context. And that is the thing that's exciting to them. Like, hey, I know how to do that. And I can help in this way. And other people are just excited to learn and to try to try to be exposed to something they don't really know much about. So there are lots of different sort of ways that you can be satisfied by doing the work, um, you know, that that can can, I don't know, be, bring an added bonus and and feel good. Let's call them endorphins and oxytocin. I'm going to go with that, Carrie. I, you must be a doctor. I, I uh, play one on TV. Plays, yeah, good one on TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are lots of ways to there are lots of ways to help. You know, and lots of ways to feel good about it. I think it's true. I I haven't read the research, but I believe it to be true. I've been managing volunteers for um over 20 years which uh yeah so your your belief is grounded in fact lest we venture yes. down the path of, on this podcast sure. of like i believe it and therefore it's true which is far too common in our culture right now yeah let's just state that hillary's beliefs in the power of volunteerism both for others and for sort of personal growth and good feelings are grounded yeah. in reality well, sounds good <laughs> well you know i also you know in addition to managing a volunteer program i also am a volunteer um to be able to 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 be focused on something externally. And also just, yeah. it feels it feels good to be around other like-minded people who also care exactly. about what you care and, about. And when you're in totally. this trench of yeah. like, you know, if, if you're in your full-time job or you have all these different responsibilities that you have to do day in and day out, it's a really, really cool change of pace to be, mm -hmm. I could see why you get the warm and fuzzy feelings because you know, you're, you're so hardworking in one element and you're always giving your all. And then to have this change of pace where you're actually 
you're giving, you're doing good to these, these animals or, or, you know, whatever volunteer work you're doing, you're going to feel good. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even when on for it maybe doesn't seem like it would be really fun. You know, when I think about my favorite volunteer opportunity and I've done all, I mean, I was in the Peace Corps in Mongolia. I um, am on the board of directors right now. I've been on the board of directors for a chimpanzee sanctuary in the past. So I have a lot of different volunteer experience, but my favorite was doing wildlife rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And it was sometimes very, I mean, it was really hard work and sometimes pretty disgusting. It's just mm -hmm. a lot of poop and, and, you know, it's just <laughs> we're making weird diets for animals that uh, don't smell really great, whatever. And I even reflected as I was doing it, that as a volunteer manager, I might sometimes think that I wouldn't want to ask volunteers to do that. Or I would think, oh, geez, volunteers might, might not want to do that because it's gross or it's hard or whatever. But then as a volunteer doing the work, I'm like, of course I would do this. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Like, what a great opportunity. And also because I know I'm helping make the job easier for staff, I was willing to do whatever it took because I was there to support them in their work. Um, and so it was interesting. I, you know, it's like I was thinking about it as I was doing it with kind of both hats on, you know? Yeah, like I used totally. to wait tables. Uh, I waited tables in college. And at Forever After, when I go to restaurants, I'm not just a patron in a restaurant. I'm a person who used to wait tables. And I view the context of the dinner and the service I get because of the way that I oh, that's such a good point, Hillary. Yeah, and so totally. it's, I think about that too as a as a per, as a person who is a practitioner of volunteer management, engaging volunteers in our work, but also having been a volunteer on the other side of the table. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm always thinking about that uh, when I when I do this work as a volunteer manager. How can I make sure that people have a really great experience and and really have the sense of satisfaction that I know can be found, you know? And so it's sometimes a conversation about how to connect them to the thing that's going to bring them that kind of joy yeah since the the the, the subject of poop, poop has been broken like normally poop doesn't come up until real late in the podcast but now it's out there real early we've gotten it out there so i'm going to just stick with the poop theme for now so in terms of what volunteers should expect you know like now and then i've heard shelters sort of talk about you know like what do volunteers think they're going to they're going to be doing when they come to the shelter you know and, and i think some folks may expect oh they're just going to be sort of picking up and squeezing the smallest most adorable animals in the shelter and that's the volunteerism but in fact there can be a fair amount of poop so i was curious like from from the sort of standpoint of someone who was kind of running this like national organization and and what you guys are doing like what are some of the things that our volunteers might be doing for us and 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 what, how does this all play out in terms of actual duties? Oh, oh my Duties, get God. it? Ah! No, I see what you oh. did there. That is terrible. I didn't even know I was I doing don't. it, but I'll take credit for it. <laughs> how do you sleep at night, Carrie Allen? That was terrible. Don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think, well, first of all, you know, we do have, we have a really wide range of volunteer opportunities at HSUS. And so, um, and, and some of them actually do include the poop, right? We have our animal rescue team. We have volunteers that we deploy when we have, um, when we set up temporary shelters, whether it's because of a natural disaster or a large scale cruelty case. So we deploy volunteers to go and provide direct care to animals in our temporary shelters and there is poop. Uh, we also have a couple of care centers, right? We have our Duchess Sanctuary in Southern Oregon and we have Black Beauty Ranch in East Texas. And so there is uh, poop there, if that's really mm -hmm. what people are interested in. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we've got something for everyone, um, but, but, uh, but, but we do really have, um, you know, a lot of what we focus on is policy work, right? Mm -hmm. Like we support all of these care centers and the direct work that they, or the direct care that they do. Um, but at HSUS, we're really focused so much more on the policy that it's really about um, try, try to prevent the cruelty from happening in the first place through our advocacy programs and, and through, and through really directly supporting the staff in their work. So there's like stuff that people can come in, you know, when people go to offices, uh, someday again, I'm sure we will, they can come into the offices that we've got in Maryland and DC and provide assistance there, or there's tons of work people can do from home. And, you know, I think it's just the, to me, the big thing is thinking about all of the different ways that people um, can kind of plug in. And I do, I think you're right that a lot of times there is a disconnect between, you know, like what people think they're going to be doing mm -hmm. as volunteers and what they actually are doing. And so I think that the trick is always to help people to understand and then also help people to draw the connection. You, you know, sometimes maybe people don't immediately understand how their advocacy will directly impact animals in a way that's, you know, it's not how it's not hands on, but it's going to be could be just as impactful for the animals and improving their conditions than totally. if they're doing that direct care themselves. And so that's such a good point. Yeah, I think it's sometimes you just have to draw the draw the connection a little bit for people. You've mentioned, you know, how do you plug in? I think 
you've mentioned this before, and then uh, the website also says it as well. But like you're saying, kind of taking a step back and seeing what are what are your skills? What do you like to do when you're looking for the right opportunity? So yes, there is a lot of Hillary. We talk about poop actually way too much. There's there's a lot of hands on animal care for sure, but. You could also do like behind the scenes administrative work, I'm assuming, or, or like, do you like working with a group of people or do you like working by yourself? So all those things about who you are as a person apply to the volunteer work that you w- want to be doing, right? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think not every, you know, there's like this sort of undetermined, like, hey, I have time and I want to help thing that people respond to. But it's also, I think much, there's a, much more of a conversation. And I always sort of, encourage prospective volunteers to really check in with themselves. Like, what am I, what am I in this for? What is the thing I actually hope to have happen, right? Is it because I want to have contact with other people and I want to be in a group and and build community? Or do I not really want to build community? And I just want to like, I just want to sit down and do data entry projects. And like, I know that sometimes that's all I want to do, you know, turn some music on and just get to town doing data entry. Like, so so having in each individual really kind of think about what it is they'd like to do and then check out. And, you know, here's, here's one other thing I would say is that, you know, of course I'm biased. I love HSUS. I've been here for 10 years. We have lots of ways to plug people into our work and I want to encourage people to check out our programs and get involved. But also I recognize that it's not necessarily going to be a good fit for every person. And I'm okay with that, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I would never want to force some, like my goal is that people's volunteer experience be like the highlight of their week. Like, oh goody, I get to do my volunteer work again. And so sometimes if it's not a good fit, that's okay. And I would, I would say to anyone like, well, fine, go find some, someplace. Like there's such need and there's so many great organizations that are looking for volunteers. To me, it's really a function of, um, it's really a function of getting people in, into something, whether it's us or with yeah. another organization, there is going to be a fit out there. And so sometimes what we do is help people find something that's going to be a good fit for us, even if it's not one of our our programs. Mm, Yeah. I know um, since we've uh, already delved into this, you know, like, and I'm sure that people are really sold between um, talking about the poop and and talking about the the non-poop opportunities, we should mention really quickly, you know, how how folks can get involved. The best place to do that is the humanesociety.org slash volunteer. Um, And we'll mention that again, but just in case all the talk of um, animal poop has really inspired you, you can go there right now. Um, like, find the poop opportunities. Right yes. Oh no. Man, you're a yeah. poop opportunity. Oh yeah. my god. Well, you know, here's the other thing I would just say about that to, that that could be helpful too is that we have the way that the opportunities are sorted there is um, that you can search by your state. Mm. So we have some opportunities yeah, that are open to anyone anywhere because we're deploying them to the animal rescue team shelter temporary shelter site. You know, because that obviously moves around. Um, but then, but then you can also search by your state. So you can find the opportunities that are available to you to do in your home, or if we have an actual location or a program that's based in your state, we can connect you with them. Mm -hmm. So we try to think about, you know, try to present it in a way that helps people to see what the broad array of options. Which is cool. It answers the question, you know, even though we're a national group, there is still volunteering at the community level that we could do too. So that's really cool. Yeah, we do a ton of work at the state level, um, you know, and it's a humane society, not humane like it's not a single thing it's this whole it's really tra- we are very holistic there are opportunities everywhere and a lot of our volunteers you know one of our program we have um, volunteers working with our state directors at the state level on local and state policy work and so they really get connected to what's going on you know they understand the federal stuff they respond when we're working on federal issues but they are really aware of everything that's going on all across their state so it's really hyper local Mm, that's great. So Hillary, just out of curiosity, like when, when you talk to people, to the volunteers in our squad or in, in other places too, like how do people generally start in this, in this work? I mean, do they, do they start to sort of like they get a wild hair one day and are like, I'm going to go volunteer for wild wow. hairs? I mean, it's like that, is that how it begins or does, is, does it typically start in another way? You know, I have, I can't, I can't remember where I read this. So it's going to sound like I made it up. I promise I didn't. But um, that, uh, that a, a survey of people, of volunteers and organizations reveal that 80% of people sort of broadly who choose to volunteer do so because they're asked. Mm. However, in animal welfare, it was exactly the opposite. 80% of people just were volunteering because they sought it out themselves, hmm. um, which I think is interesting. I think it, probably speaks to the fact that shelter, you know, animal care 
organizations generally tend to be so focused on the mission, they're not always mm -hmm. stopping to ask around. Um, and also because people really have this, such a strong connection to animals, you know, when they think about like, geez, I have some extra time. What, what's the thing that's going to make me feel good? What's the thing that's going to really be a really good use of my spare time and have me feel really connected? Animals are an obvious uh, answer. And I think probably more so than other sort of niche uh, parts of the nonprofit sector, you know, this is something that I think is sort of generally appealing. And, you know, in this country, we have a really strong culture around volunteerism and civil society. So we do have, you know, I think there's just more of a conversation where people are like, yeah, if you have spare time, you go and volunteer. That's, that's what you do when you have, have spare time. How has COVID affected volunteerism in other ways? And, and I would assume it helps me. Does it help with mental health uh, in terms of making an impact? Yeah, well, you know, it has been, I mean, certainly everything has changed. <laughs> uh, you know, everything has changed. Um, and so volunteerism has changed as well as operations in, in departments and organizations have had to be modified. Um, and so, you know, externally, there's been a ton of conversation in the broader animal sheltering community about how to handle volunteers in this era when, you know, we're trying to limit the number of people coming into the building and keeping people safe. And so every organization that I am aware of, really, in the known universe has had to sort of grapple with this, as, just as they have with figuring out staff schedules and care schedules for the animals and building teams so that you don't have people working with a bunch of, you know, like unnecessarily exposing people. So that sort of conversation has been happening kind of across the board and a lot of programs um, have sort of been suspended, um, people engaged and to make, you know, to help find new ways for people to help mm -hmm. instead of just being in the, in the building. So people have had to be a lot more sort of inventive and creative mm -hmm. and think outside of the box about all of the stuff that needs to get done. Um, so it's been really interesting to, to sort of pay attention to that conversation. I think, um, I, think, I think the changes that have been implemented during these COVID times in terms of expanding what things volunteers are doing so that it's not just direct care, I think mm. will probably continue after we're able to have volunteers back in the buildings. But at HSUS, you know, certainly at our care centers, we did just like every other care environment where we were limiting volunteer access to the property um, just because we wanted to keep our staff safe and keep our volunteers safe and, and to have some level of predictability in terms of who was there when. Um, and it, with our animal rescue team, you know, we were still having to deploy, we, we have animals in care and we need volunteers to help us care for them. So we have been following very strict safety protocols to ensure everybody's safety is a part of their um, engagement with the program. But with our, with our policy volunteers and the people who are doing stuff remotely, it's sort of like mostly the same. You know, we do, some of our policy volunteers had been in the practice of doing in-person meetings with legislators or going to hearings and those are happening on Zoom just like everything else in the world is. And so I think we've all been able to make the shift really uh, well at, in the organization. Um, we have internship programs at HSUS and our interns have been working remotely and getting mm -hmm. the same mentoring and learning opportunities that they would normally. So, you know, we're a pretty resilient bunch, I think, in this business. We know how to roll with the punches and, and shift gears really quickly. And I think that we've been able to do that. But I would also say that one of the things that has been most challenging, I think, about this pandemic, I mean, aside from not knowing when it's going to end and the uncertainty about timing, you know, humans love predictions ability and we want and it would have been so great if that hey everybody shelter in place for three weeks <laughs> thing had worked and we could have gone back to life as normal um but it didn't and so i think that's when something that people have really been kind of grappling with is the uncertainty in terms of time but also not knowing how to help it's it's been a very helpless feeling i think for a lot of people and so having an opportunity even if there are lots of other things that you can't do to have something that you can do that is like a that is actionable that's tangible that's a benefit i think is really it it, it really does help uh, mm -hmm. to have that focus otherwise it's just like i mean how many loaves of bread can you bake i mean carrie you, you'd be the one to answer that You're the <laughs> don't baker, ask right? don't ask yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's really best answer. to not talk about that yeah yeah i i think this is a really interesting point you know like in in terms of our focus on policy you know i would imagine that at least there are some um the the good side if they're there really can't be said to be a good side of COVID at all, but 
it does help that um, we do have so many volunteer opportunities that are not necessarily right there in a, in a, in a barn, in an office that can be done virtually. I mean, I, I would think that the policy volunteers are shoveling a different kind of poop at times, but it's still, you know, it's very, it's, it's a really important piece of the work. And I, I guess I'd like to know from you, like, I would imagine, you know, that if someone has thought that volunteerism was going to kind of be, you know, snuggling puppies or even shoveling poop, that they might feel a little intimidated by the idea of working on policy work. Like, how do you kind of gear people up to be comfortable making the ask to a legislator, going into an office, having that cover or going onto a Zoom and having that conversation? Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, we, you know, we are, we have something like, we have over 700 volunteers in our policy program. And and some of them came to the program already as accomplished advocates who had been doing the work for a really long time and, and, and wanted to sort of operate in the context of this program. And other people just like had no idea really what it was about, but were willing to learn. And so we really view that program as, a, 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 as a, like a training academy. We connect volunteers with each other so that people can learn from more experienced volunteers who have done this before. But we recognize that, you know, if we spend the time to train right. and to, to really coach our volunteers on how to be effective animal advocates, they will not only be effective on our issues and, mm -hmm. and in support of HSUS, but also they'll, they'll have those advocacy skills that they can really use on any other issue that's really important totally, to them. Yeah. And so it's like, uh, you know, so we're sort of creating the change that we want to see, right, with all of these really well-educated advocates who, who, who feel comfortable doing it. And I will say, too, that... Um, it is, it can be really intimidating. Like there's no question. I mean, I think it would be, I would be, it would be disingenuous to suggest otherwise. And also I think about the first time that I went and lobbied on Capitol Hill in DC, it was very weird feeling at first. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. somebody said something and, and that reminded me like, they work for us. Mm. Like, and that really <laughs> changed everything for me. Like they're not, you know, of course they're, they are a do all respect and, and with all due deference, we'll engage with them. But also, they work for us. And so it is our job to help them to understand what matters to their constituents. Um, and so it really demystified the process for me. So we do a really good job of, of, of helping to train people on the issues so they feel like they know what the heck it is they're supposed to be talking about when they go in and help them and give them language to use and let them practice. Um, and then also, you know, we often will have partner them with a more experienced advocate so that oh, they are going yeah. in alone. Yeah. Um, and a that was actually, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was walking around on Capitol Hill the first time, I, um, I was in a big group. We had a bunch of volunteers. I live in Washington state. So we had a bunch of Washington state advocates and we were walking around like in a little gaggle from office mm -hmm. to office. Um, but then um, another year I went, I was like the only person from my congressional district who was there. And so I went and had a meeting with the staffer by myself and, it was just so comfortable. Like their job is taking care of constituents and connecting with people and they're really lovely. Um, and so it really, like I, I was anxious the first time and then once I did it, I was like, it's easy, I can do this anytime. And so, you know, helping people to sort of, you know, to demystify it and then give them, you know, they get little training wheels to get started. And then mm -hmm. once they've got it, they can apply it all over the place. It's pretty great. Yeah. And not, yeah, that's great. That's cool. So not only do we, you know, make an impact, impact as a volunteer for direct care but the legislative process that's really cool that that you can say that you do learn those skills and then at the end of the day it's a huge bonding experience i think that's the the common thing of volunteering is like hey we we went through this together we did this we told that congressman what's yeah. what together <laughs> exactly exactly yeah yeah, well, I will say I in Washington, I'm very lucky. We have a very animal friendly Washington delegation to Congress. So it's really easy to go in and mm -hmm. have those conversations. Um, but, you know, even when your legislator isn't as friendly to animal issues, you know, it's still like, it's still okay to go in and say, here's what I think is important. And that's what we do in all kinds of different ways in our everyday lives, right? We make decisions and we take actions based on our values and our beliefs. And so like, you know, speaking to legislators and letting them know what we care about is part of that. But you know, the other thing I would say too, is that I think learning is one of the big motivators that a lot of people have mm. for volunteering, you know, um, because, you know, sometimes people don't know what they don't, I mean, obviously every time people don't know what they don't know. And so sometimes they don't realize like how much there is to learn. You know, like when I went to volunteer doing wildlife rehabilitation, you know, I just was like, here, I want to help, not realizing how much I would learn about each individual species and their care and their behavior and how wildlife rehab works. And it was like, because I'm such a nerd, sorry, 
that's true. <laughs> because I'm such a nerd, I was like, oh, this is great. Um, and, and I mean, and, and people can learn in all kinds of ways. I mean, and you know, the work that we do at HSUS, I mean, we have so many different, um, we have so many different bits of work that are ongoing kind of all the time. And there's so much happening. It's really pretty fascinating. And so I think that's one of the things that we, one of the things that really attracts people to us is that they, you know, they hear about the work we're doing and they're like, geez, I would like to support that. And then we always, you know, we always want to provide context to people when they're doing tasks. It's not just like alphabetize these things. It's like, here's what we're working on and here's what you're doing. This is how what you're doing is going to help us. So it's a real opportunity to kind of see how, what all it takes to be an organization of this size and to get all of this work done. And I think we tend to have a lot of people who are really curious and interested um, and they have an opportunity to learn, which is really And what a cool way to see if this is something, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case when you're just volunteering, but if somebody ever wanted to make, make a career out of this, I feel like volunteering would be the perfect way to start. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, because really, again, you don't know what you don't know, mm -hmm. right? And so if, if you think that you want to uh, work at an animal shelter, what better way to, to learn about it than to go and to do the work and to be sort of on the inside of the organization and Maybe you find out you hate snuggling puppies. You hate right. snuggling puppies. That's <laughs> just awful. It's not I what you want to do at all. <laughs> Who, maybe it turns out that puppy kisses aren't what they have to be. Yeah, just right? awful. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But I think, but I will say, you know, we, I get the question. I get asked the question all the time. Like I am thinking of a career change. Like I always thought I wanted to work with the animals. Here I am down this other career path. I don't even know how I wound up doing this. How can I, you know, I'm thinking about really, you know, I'm taking stock and I want to think about doing something differently. What should I do? And my response is always, and I promise this is not just because of my own self-interest. My answer is always, you definitely volunteer. Definitely volunteer because again, you learn the context and you learn more of the, of, uh, of the field and can figure out what part is going to be the best fit for you. But also, you know, um, getting, making relationships, establishing relationships with people in an organization and like showing up, doing the work and being really great at your work is a way to like gain attention. And I, I'm never going to say to somebody like, oh, the way to get hired is for sure to volunteer first. But let's be honest, when you think about it, like people tend to, you know, if they've, if if somebody is a known quantity and you've seen how excellent they are as an as a volunteer, they kind of come to the top of mind. I used to have my my best volunteers hired a staff in my shelter all the time. It was really frustrating. <laughs> like, quit poaching my volunteers. Go find your own staff. Like, they're the one. They're awesome. Oh, but I guess maybe they could get paid for it. That would be different, right? <laughs> um, but so I do think that happens. You know, when people are standout volunteers, people know who they are, and 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 you know, you can have a different conversation with them about whether or not a role is a good fit. But I I do think it really does help people figure it out and. You know, the other thing I would say is that a lot of times, you know, there, there are ways that you can come to this work where you're like, geez, I really love animals. How can I do something for animals? But the other approach is like, I'm really good at this thing. Like I'm an accountant and I want to be an accountant on behalf of animals, mm. right? Like I am a fundraiser, but I want to be a fundraiser on behalf of animals. And so, you know, when I started this job, I was a volunteer manager. I mean, when I started in the field, I had been a volunteer manager previously at another organization and then saw an opening at an animal shelter. And I was like, well, I don't really know anything about animals, but I sure do know how to run a volunteer program. And in fact, the feedback I got after I got the job was that that was why I was hired because they needed, you know, like there are lots of people who know the animal stuff, but to know the program stuff and to be able to apply it in the animal context was what they really needed at that time. So I think about that a lot. Like it's not, you know, we can teach the animal stuff. Um, but if you've got a set of skills that could be applied in, and, you know, you can be an attorney and work on animal stuff, right? There are all kinds of ways that you can plug whatever your professional skill is into, into something that will help benefit the animals in the long run. Yeah. So what is the program, uh, the future of volunteering for the HSUS look like one year, three years, five years down the road for you and your team? That's, um, thank you for asking. It's something I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, I'm pleased to say that HSUS has been undergoing this process of certification, which is a, really a way of, of helping to um, ensure that we're really making the most out of our volunteer engagement across the organization. And so we have been doing needs assessments um, with programs and campaigns around the organization. You know, it's easy. And I, you've heard me talk a lot about our policy volunteers because we do so much policy work. Obviously there's, you know, having a volunteer working on that 
in their local community is great. But what we're, we're now really looking at doing is figuring out um, more sort of nuanced ways for people to support our staff in their work, right? Because when you think about volunteer work, it's like uh, there's, there's a category of things that like our staff would like to get done, but that we're not able to do or we're the, not the right people to do. We just need more people spreading the word and doing the, um, doing the advocacy work. And, and we've got that part covered. But thinking about supporting Carrie and her team or supporting you, Austin, in your work, right? Because there's the stuff that you have on your plate that you probably have a hard time getting to or that maybe mm -hmm. you could peel off and have some person yeah. help you with. And so that's really exciting to think about the ways that we can find the right people with the skills that you all need in, in supporting your team and plugging people in that way. So I think what we'll see over the next few years, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is finding new and exciting ways to plug people into our work at HSUS. But I also think that the big trend in volunteer management more broadly is that, you know, it used to be that the model was have, you know, I mean, it was to have a position that lasted for like three months, six months or a year that people had to sign up to make that commitment. And certainly that's true for some of our volunteer opportunities because it takes a while to get people trained, you know, and we want to get people up to speed. We ask for, uh, you know, an extended period of time to really help make sure that they're all plugged in. But the trend is really to think about how, you know, today people are interested more in like a quick little shots of volunteerism, you know, like a mm -hmm. one-time project or something that's a little bit more narrow in scope. And so figuring out how to plug people in with something can't have you, maybe you can't make a commitment for two hours every week, right. every Wednesday from now till the next, for the next year, right? That's fair. I'm not sure I could at this point, so I get it. Um, but to figure out how, how to like get that, uh, you know, create opportunities for people to get in, help and move along if they want to, or have a bunch of little small projects that people can do over time that might be more sustainable long term. So it's an interesting thing to sort of grapple with and to figure out. Um, because it's definitely a shift in there. This trend in, in, in volunteer engagement more broadly is to the sort of micro volunteering. It's mm, kind of cool. Again, I'm a nerd. So this is just <laughs> something I like to think about. <laughs> no, I, I, I really think that it's, that it's exciting to be able to get them, especially if volunteers are interested in working with animals in all of the different ways, seeing all the things that people are doing in different departments, which is a microcosm. It's like an ecosystem in this organization of different things we're doing perfect idea to do something like that so really really cool very exciting yeah thanks yeah we're really good about it we have a one of our volunteer opportunities is a special projects role and so we have sort of a um uh, an army of standby volunteers to help us with just like one-off cool. projects um and sometimes it's data entry sometimes it's research sometimes it's you know doing some formatting stuff like I mean, it's any number of things. So we have this group of people, we email them and say, hey, anybody able to take on this project? And we've got something like 40 or 50 of these people that are just hanging out. Like it's, it's and it's really, it's been great. And we've had so many um, success stories from people who've engaged these volunteers. They're like, that was awesome. I didn't have to do that myself. Like, how can I get more of that? Um, so it's our, part of our plan to take over the world yeah. by making sure everybody knows how awesome our volunteers are. They're really terrific. It's a huge range of really talented, smart, passionate people who are just looking at looking at how they can get involved. And I'm delighted to be able to figure out the best way to do that. Hilary Hager, Senior Director of Outreach and Engagement for the Humane Society of the United States. Thank you again so much for sitting down to chat with us. That's all we have for today's show. To find out more about how you can sign up to volunteer and make an impact for animals, be sure to head to humanesociety.org slash volunteer. Thank you so much for tuning in and see you next time on Humane Voices. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.